So I want to welcome uh, all of you to the San Francisco Regional Mensa Speaker Series and to today's speaker, Christopher Branson Lohman, an archaeologist, PhD, treasure hunters who discover lost cities encrusted in gold. But how well do we really know the work of these scientists? Today, Dr. Lohman will tell us about the seven myths of archaeology. Christopher Branson Lohman has a Chinese Quarters Project in Palo Alto and a survey analysis of Japanese Ainu artifacts. Welcome to you, Dr. Lohman. Thank you very much, and, and thank you so much for having me and for that introduction. So uh, today I wanted to tell you about what I call the seven myths of archaeology. These are common misunderstandings about what archaeology is, mostly based on the way that it's portrayed in movies, TV, magazines, video games, and toys. This is a lecture that I give at the beginning of my Intro to Archaeology classes at San Francisco State University and UC Berkeley, although I've added some content that is special for you today. The seven myths that I'll be looking at over the next 45 minutes or so are the myths that archaeologists work alone, that their main goals are seeking treasure, that archaeology takes place only in distant deserts and focused on ancient ruins. That it has anything to do with aliens in Atlantis. Or even that it requires excavation to be archaeology. And finally, debunking the myth that it belongs in a museum is the best solution to the end of any archaeology dig. At the end, I would love to do some questions and answers, and I'll keep track of any questions that you have in chat as we go along. If it's a quick question, then I might answer it as we go, but if it's not, I'll keep it in the back of my head and return to it at the end of the lecture. I'll be asking a few questions as we go along as well, so if you'd like to participate, feel free to reply in chat. So myth number one is that archaeologists explore and work alone. This was a picture of me while I was working on the survey and what's called a shovel test pit at the beginning of excavations at Stanford's Chinese Arboretum quarters. And it looks like I'm by myself. And if you look up photographs of archaeologists, they are often shown by themselves. But of course, someone else has to be there to take the picture. It's more complicated than that though. In popular conceptions of archeologists, as I said, in movies, TV shows, video games, or toys, archeologists were portrayed overwhelmingly as solitary, white, male, and colonial, usually with fancy facial hair. Playmobil has recently updated their archeologist kit so it looks a little less like it's coming out of the 1920s. And the new one is much better. They have the correct tools like trowels and brushes. They have field equipment for recording like cameras and even a little label for the excavation. Still gets a few things wrong. Archeologists don't dig willy nilly uh, and create just a hole in the ground. It is measured. We need to know exactly where everything came from because of the importance of context, something that I'll get to in the next few slides. Also, I have never seen a professional archeologist work in short shorts. <laughs> so this is what a real archeology span dig looks like. This is a particularly large one, but there's always some kind of field crew. This is the site Chattahoyuk, a settlement in Anatolia, Turkey, that goes back about 9,000 years and was inhabited for uh, over a thousand years. 
when I worked there in 2008, there were multiple international teams that circulated in and out. But at any given time, there were about 100 archaeologists who were on site. I'm curious, reply in chat if you have heard of Chattahoyuk before, or if you've gotten a chance to visit. You can see some visitors to the site in the back, and then in the foreground, those are all archaeologists. This is what a field team list looked like a few years after I worked there. But as you can see, this is not a solitary archaeologist out in the middle of nowhere. So instead of thinking of an archaeologist as working by themselves, think of all of the people who are involved in any given dig. There's an archaeology team in the field, working in labs, both professors and students, professional archaeologists and specialists who might know more about zoo archaeology, the study of animals, paleoethnobotany, the use of plant remains to understand lifeways in the past. Some of the other important people involved in any dig are descendants of people who lived there in the past or the local community, and of course, support from institutions, governments, museums, grant agencies. So an archaeologist is never completely alone. Myth number two is that archaeologists focus on seeking treasure. Again, I have a question for chat. Do any of you happen to recognize this idol? Not sure yet? So this is the idol from the opening scene of the most famous archaeology film out there, Raiders of the Lost Ark. This is the idol that Indiana Jones has to carefully remove from its pedestal and replace with a perfectly weighted bag of sand. Spoilers, it doesn't work. It is one of the most iconic pop culture archaeology items out there, but it has a more complicated backstory. This is supposedly based on a real idol of uh, Plaza Teotl, which was called at the time of its discovery an absolutely, uh, absolutely unique in the history of Mexican art. It was found in a Paris shop in 1899, and any time that you hear that something is absolutely unique, that should raise concerns. Even though the idol that this is based on is today in the collection of the Dumbarton Oaks, more recent analysis has shown that it could not have been made without the use of industrial rotary tools. The fact that there's nothing else out there that looks like it and that it has no prior provenance, no origin prior to showing up in Paris, all point to this object being a fake. So if archaeologists focus only on treasure, if there's this one item, it can be incredibly easy to fake. Instead, archaeologists look for context. This is one of the reasons that archaeologists so often are shown studying tiny shards of ceramic, tiny pieces of broken pots. It's careful recording of the context of these pieces of pots or other small things that have been forgotten in the ground that lead to archaeologists being able to actually say something about what happened in the past. These pots are illustrations based on some found by archaeologist Max Uli at the turn of the 20th century while working in Peru. 
He was able to use these to create a chronology, a relative dating system where none was recorded before. I'm a visual learner myself. So putting it another way and in pictures, when archeologists initially do a dig, they carefully keep track of the stratigraphy in the ground, the different layers of soil that indicate changes in events over time. Maybe a house was built up and then fell down. That would create a distinct layer. So if archeologists notice that certain kinds of ceramics are found consistently in certain layers, not just in one site, but across multiple sites, then they begin to be able to recognize which types of pots tend to predate or post-date others. This means that if a third site is found and it doesn't have as much preservation, but it does have a certain kind of pot, then archeologists can begin to suggest that it comes from this middle time period in the example on the screen. Putting it another way, archeologists can create what are called frequency seriations. These are assemblages of artifacts that have been used to understand changes in the popularity of certain styles over time. So maybe duck pots were really popular a long time ago. And then later, yama pots became popular. And finally, pots with little snakes or worms on them became popular latest. These aren't real examples. These do match up approximately to the different periods that Max Uli identified. But the period system that he happened to use at the turn of the century is no longer used. What we have today though, are all kinds of techniques for exact dating. So we can take these different layers in soil and use techniques like radiocarbon dating to understand not only the likely date ranges that these pots came from, but also the possible exact dates in time. This is something that we see happening today too. So think about the relative popularity of different kinds of cell phones. If an archeologist in the distant future were to look at a layer of soil that came from the year 2012, they might find certain kinds of iPhones, but of course, no iPhones that were made later than that. So this is a process that has been happening throughout human history with material culture. There are rises and falls in the popularity of different designs. So all of this is to illustrate the idea that archaeologists aren't just seeking treasure. They're seeking context and knowledge about the past. So myth number three of seven is that archaeology primarily takes place in deserts. This is a painting of Napoleon confronting the Sphinx in Egypt prior to its re-excavation in the 19th century. It's true that some archeology span takes place in deserts, other archeology span in jungles. In both cases, those are areas where the environmental conditions lead to preservation through the climate, or preservation simply due to the inability of people to easily access the site. But archeology span takes place in urban places too. A few years ago, the Bloomberg tablets, Roman wooden tablets that had been preserved underneath 
what was a construction site in London and is today the Bloomberg headquarters were discovered. Unfortunately, the Bloomberg headquarters has incorporated them into a museum. These offer fascinating glimpses into what Roman life in London would have been like between 50 and 80 CE. One of my favorites is someone who's trying to collect on a debt that they uh, loaned out to someone and implores them saying, I, I implore you by bread and salt. That's the kind of everyday phrase that might not be captured in histories or chronicles of monarchs or the elite that we get by examining everyday objects from the past. Here in San Francisco, one of the most interesting recurring kinds of archeology span is the discovery of sunken ships. If you look at a map of San Francisco from the 1840s up through 1849, the coastline and the edge of the bay look really different than they do today. Quite a bit of San Francisco's waterfronts have been built out on landfill, collapsed buildings, and purposefully sunk ships. One of those ships was the Niantic. You can see the stern and rudder today in the San Francisco Maritime Museum. It arrived in San Francisco as a sailing ship but then was flipped upside down and turned into a store ship and then a hotel before being burned in the early 1850s. It simply became part of landfill and was only rediscovered in the 1970s. I'm curious if any of you have been to the San Francisco Maritime Museum or if you've heard of the sunken ships before. So speaking of 19th century San Francisco, that leads directly into myth number four, which is the idea that archeology span focuses only on things that are ancient. It's true that archeologists are discovering new things about ancient sites all the time. Just a few years ago, chemical analysis of the stones at Stonehenge allowed archeologists to trace the origins not too far away. But archeologists also look at sites in the 19th, 20th, and even the 21st centuries. I'm curious, reply in chat. Do any of you have a guess about what the artifact on the screen was originally part of. I've got one message that has already guessed correctly. Yes, excellent. So this was part of a ketchup bottle. Michael Carl and Roberta, you got it. So we know from the codes on the bottom of the ketchup bottle that this was made by Heinz, that it did in fact originally contain ketchup and that it was manufactured during the 1890s. You can see the 1890 patent date on the bottom. This continued to be used for some time. So it's probably not from 1890 specifically, but we know that it's from after that date. This was found at the Arboretum Chinese Quarters at Stanford. And it's a reminder of many things. For the descendants of people who lived at the site, this was exciting because they recognized that this is the same kind of ketchup bottle that we continue to use today, with probably the same difficulty actually pouring it out of the bottle. They were also excited because the word ketchup comes from ketchup, it was originally a Chinese and uh, Southeast Asian sauce. It would have been made with vinegar rather than with tomatoes. So it started off simply as a type of sauce that later became predominantly associated with tomato ketchup. 
This also comes from the time of Chinese exclusion. It's a reminder that even after 1882 and the subsequent laws that made it so difficult for Chinese people to come to the United States and to continue to live here, that they did. And that something that we assume to be all American, like ketchup, actually has this mixed international origin. Archaeologists work on sites well into the 20th century as well. There are multiple excavations at places like Amache, which focus on the archaeology of the Japanese internment camps during the Second World War. Often, these archaeology digs partner with people who lived through that internment or their descendants with an explicit goal of making more people remember that this part of history took place. There are even more recent archaeology projects that focus on the 21st century. Archaeology is a major component of the Undocumented Migrant Project, the work of Dr. Jason DeLeon from UCLA. This is contemporary archaeology and unfortunately, the recovery of bodies and possessions along the US border with Mexico. This dig too has a specifically political purpose and is also designed to draw people's attention to the human side of people crossing the border and the effect on people's lives that the militarization of the US-Mexico border has had. So myth number five, aliens, Atlantis, Anasazi. If I get into a Lyft or Uber, or when I'm talking to someone for the first time and they find out that I'm an archeologist, it is unfortunately incredibly common that I am asked about something pseudoscientific. Is Atlantis real? Did aliens build the pyramid? you have probably seen headlines related to archaeology that say things like mystery finally solved or that feature images like this or as recently as august 2020 headlines like this the idea that aliens or a lost race or some other kind of supernatural component played any role in the construction of Stonehenge, of pyramids, of the mounds across the United States, and the rest of North America, is actually part of a long colonial and racist legacy. Do any of you recognize this site? This is a famous archaeology site. Some of you may have seen pictures of it before, or maybe some of you have visited. Michael got it. This is Great Zimbabwe, located in the country that is named for the archaeology site, Zimbabwe. Great Zimbabwe was a settlement and major trade center in southern Africa between the 11th and the 15th centuries CE. However, when the ruins were rediscovered by archaeologists from Europe in the 18th and 19th centuries, they did not believe that the local people or their ancestors could have possibly built this site. They assumed, based on their racist worldview, that that was impossible. Because of this assumption, all kinds of other claims were made about Zimbabwe's origins. Lost tribes of Israel, 
a very lost Roman legion, or perhaps a vanished race of some other kind that was probably European in origin. All of these have been thoroughly debunked, but it took until the 1920s and the work of archaeologist Gertrude Catton Thompson to begin to change the minds of European and United States archaeologists, even though the local people could have told you that their ancestors had created the site. This is far from an isolated case of racism getting in the way of scientific analysis. This has happened, as I mentioned before, at the mound sites across the United States. Places like Serpent Mound in Ohio, the mounds along the Mississippi, or like this one from an illustration from an excavation in Louisiana in the 1840s. You can see the stratigraphy really neatly there. Or stories about the mounds that were right here in the Bay Area. Some of you may have been to Emeryville Mall, which is built over the top of what was once the largest of the shell mounds that ringed San Francisco Bay, up into Marin, across the East Bay, and on the peninsula. I discovered just a couple years ago that where I grew up in Palo Alto, right on the edge of San Antonio Road, was just a few blocks away from what was called the Castro Mound, one of these giant shell mounds. In the 19th century, archeologists refused to believe that these mounds could have been created by Native Americans. In the era of manifest destiny, any scientific explanation that went against the political dispossession of land was brushed under the rug. So be aware of any explanations that you hear that simply seek to give credit to something supernatural rather than to human ingenuity, particularly when it is doubting the intelligence of local people. That is a hallmark of racist pseudoscience. Myth number six is that all archeology span involves excavation. In most movies, magazines, and games, excavation is the biggest part of the discovery. It's all about the journey to recover an object, usually a single treasure. Often, this leads to the disturbance of some ancient supernatural force, whether it's a living mummy uh, or uh, a horrible monster, but the story quickly veers away from anything resembling real archaeology. In real life, archaeologists use all kinds of techniques besides excavation. Some of you may have come across articles like this one talking about LIDAR, light detection and ranging, which uses pulsed lasers to measure exact distances from the source of the LIDAR, often in a plane. This is one of the tools that archaeologists use to see beneath dense tree cover. The way this works is that laser pulses return every time that they meet reflection surfaces. They bounce back and split into multiple returns. So a, an aerial photo like this, exactly what you'd see from the cockpit of a plane, once you apply LIDAR, looks more like this. 
This is a photo from the work of Kate Johnson in New England, but shows historic walls and the outlines of potential archaeology sites in a landscape that otherwise renders them invisible. There are other forms of remote sensing and survey that allow archaeologists to conduct work without excavation at all, or in preparation for later excavation. One of them is ground penetrating radar, or GPR. Ground penetrating radar measures changes in soil density, which is useful for looking for pits or ditches with more compacted floors or for hollow spaces like graves or particularly dense spaces like a stone wall hidden underground. Many of you have hopefully seen the movie Jurassic Park, which is about paleontology, kind of, rather than archaeology, since it has to do with dinosaurs, although I do really love dinosaurs. The GPR shown in Jurassic Park isn't what real GPR looks like. There is no way to shoot a single pulse underground and come back with a perfect image of a skeleton like that. GPR is far more general in its results. In real life, GPR ends up looking something like this. By placing the GPR machine in a little, uh, little carriage and dragging it in a straight line across a grid, you can get a readout that looks something like this. Definitely not a clear skeleton, but it's still useful. We can look more closely at this image, map on different colors depending on what the GPR has picked up as more or less change in soil density and find areas that feature anomalies. Further, what's called ground truthing, often involving excavation, would be needed to figure out exactly what was going on, whether this is a, uh, a pit or whether it is simply a different kind or density of soil remains to be seen in this case. Archaeologists can then take these slices and reassemble them, knitting them together to create a, uh, a single map at different depths. So these are composed of multiple lines of the GPR to create horizontal slices down into the ground. And there is that same bowl-shaped anomaly that you saw in the vertical readout. All of this is useful because it helps archaeologists figure out exactly where they want to dig, but it can be ethical too. In some cases, indigenous people, local people, or descendants, people who lived at what are now archaeology sites, continue to have religious or spiritual beliefs about disturbing the ground that might contain traces of their ancestors' lives. So, figuring out other techniques besides excavation, whether that's remote sensing or things like catch and release survey, in collaboration with Indigenous people today, is an important part of the present and future of archaeology. That brings me to the last of the seven myths. The idea that the logical place for everything after an archaeology dig is to put it in a museum. 
I'm curious to know and reply in chat uh, if you'd like, but are there particular museums that have stood out to you that have had an impact on the way that you think about the past? For me, the Penn Museum in Philadelphia and the Museum of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia stand out in my mind as having a particular impact on me. If you have had a chance to visit either of those, I'd love to know. But in general, I'd love to know what other museums you have particularly enjoyed. Places like, yeah, the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Museums are a fantastic tool for the preservation of objects. So often what the public sees is only a small part of what is in the museum. There are storage centers and conservation halls that the public seldom sees. I see other answers agreeing about the Met or the British Museum. However, museums, like many other parts of archaeology, also have a complicated colonial legacy. During the 18th, 19th, and much of the 20th century, archaeologists and other professionals and government officials traveled the world and tended to extract the objects that they found to be the most beautiful or interesting and take them to their home country, often without permission of the local people or through dubious means. The Parthenon marbles are probably the most famous example of this in uh, the British Museum, but taken from Greece, and none of the official paperwork for their removal has ever been supplied. It happens here in the United States as well. Academics, unfortunately, have a long and often damaging history of an emphasis on putting things in boxes, both conceptually, like specific categories, which are often far more complicated in real life, and literally taking things and putting them in museums, sometimes unfortunately often in the past without permission. Starting in 1990, a law called NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, has gone into effect and gone through several revisions over the last three decades. It seeks to address this history of dispossession and looting of tribal ancestors and bodies here in the United States. There aren't international laws that cover the repatriation of Native American uh, grave goods or ancestors' bodies, but this national law has been a start. If you haven't heard about NAGPRA before and you're interested in learning more about it, I highly recommend this comic book. It's actually written by two archaeologists and a professional archaeological illustrator. And it seeks to unravel some of the legal mysteries of how NAGPRA works. But it's something that I assign to my students in my intro to archaeology classes. It's also available in its entirety online at nagpracomics.weebly.com. I highly recommend checking out this work by Sonia Adelai, Jen Shannon, and John Swagger. In closing this section, casting doubt on museums as the only place for things to end up, it's also very important to recognize the impact that archaeology has on the lives of living people. I'm joining you today from Berkeley, California, which is both the ancestral and current homeland of the Chochenyo Ohlone. 
all across the Bay Area, there are different branches of Ohlone speaking peoples who call this place home. And I encourage you, wherever you're joining from today, to check out this website, nativeland.ca, and find out whose land are you on? What is the living community doing? What kinds of activism and heritage practices are they involved in? In many cases, living tribal members, whether or not they're federally or not federally recognized, work with archaeologists or have their own cultural resource management firms. So collaboration with indigenous people, with native tribes and communities continues to be an important part of archaeology today. In conclusion, I've talked about these seven myths started out with images that probably call to mind popular conceptions of archaeology, but I hope that I've been able to turn some of those on their heads. Archaeologists work not alone, but in teams, alongside multiple experts, stakeholder community members to understand people's lives in the past. And archaeology doesn't just take place far away or focused on long ago, but it takes place all over the world in urban and remote locations. It requires a wide variety of skills and tools, not just excavation. Archaeologists can focus on any time in the past and should be just as concerned about the impact of our work on people and communities today as we are about learning about people in the past. Thank you so much for coming to the, coming to the talk today. I hope that uh, you learned some new things. I also hope that you recognized some of the, the things in the talk. Archaeology is a big part of pop culture. So I tried to play off of that. And I'd love to have an opportunity to talk more casually with you now to answer any questions that you have or uh, to, uh, to tell you more about archaeology. Go ahead and look through the questions that have shown up in chat so far, but feel free to add more. Uh, and I uh, would would happily talk to talk to any of you too. So uh, going up, Michael, you asked about Chattahoyuk and did it predate agriculture? Agriculture emerges in different forms all around the world at, at different times. Uh, Chattahoyuk is a Neolithic settlement, so forms of agriculture were already taking place uh, when it was occupied. Recently, there's been a lot of doubt cast on the hard line between agricultural versus hunter-gatherer societies. People are understanding that it is far more nuanced than most textbooks from the 20th century tended to outline. For example, here in California, the understanding that native Californians were intimately involved in tending what were assumed to be wild trees, plants, and other aspects of the environment is becoming increasingly obvious through the use of traditional ecological knowledge and collaboration with archaeologists to get a a sense of deep time. Uh, I got a couple questions privately as well. How are the two spout with connecting handle pots of South America used by the makers? That's a great question. I don't actually know how they were used. I know that archaeologists use all kinds of tools to try to figure out what vessels from the past once contained. And that can be a big clue as to 
their use. Sometimes it's surprising. My own work focuses on historical archaeology, so things that are much more recent. But some of the analysis of archaeologists working at Market Street Chinatown, the Chinatown that was one of the multiple Chinatowns that was located in San Jose here in the Bay Area, found that beer bottles discovered at the site that were originally made to contain beer, in fact, had traces of lipids inside of them. They appear to have been used for some other kind of food storage. This is one of the other examples of putting things neatly into simple categories often doesn't work. Sometimes the same vessel, whether it's from ancient times or more recently, is used for multiple purposes. Many of you probably have similar things in your own houses. Maybe you have cigar boxes filled with buttons or mason jars that once stored mayonnaise, but now store something else. So I would need to go back and look up more about what archeologists know about the, the, uh, the double spout pots like that. Um, let's see, other questions. If laser ID of the uh, Plaza de Algo idol has been performed, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure if the Dumbarton Oaks idol has been examined using lasers. 3D printing is a really exciting direction that museums are going for uh, preserving artifacts in a new way. Photographs, illustrations, and 3D printing, copies or models, all have advantages and disadvantages in terms of allowing people to study the original item. But I've seen some 3D printed models of artifacts in museums, and it's really exciting to see that technology improving. When I visited Japan in 2016, I saw a 3D printed knife in one of the Ainu museums in Hokkaido that looked beautiful, even though it was made out of plastic. It preserved all of the details of the, of the item. So I'm excited to see where that kind of technology will go in the future, both in terms of preservation and in terms of artifact analysis. Uh, I saw a bunch of answers to museums that had, a, had had an impact on you, which was exciting to see. The New York Met, uh, the British Museum, Museum at Princeton, the Pergamon in Berlin. I visited that museum as well. I also see someone asking about a ship at Ocean Beach that gets uncovered periodically. There are actually multiple shipwrecks up and down the, the San Francisco coast on the ocean side. I'm not sure about whether there are uh, more information about the ship at Ocean Beach, but there was an excavation quite recently of a ship that was wrecked near Año Nuevo State Park. I'm actually assigning an article about it in my California archaeology class at San Francisco State. Um, let's see, uh, someone pointed out more of a, a comment, a book about archaeologists discovering uh, evidence of Roman legions in the Teutoburg forest, including a wall built by German tribes. There's some really exciting archaeology having to do with Rome outside of Rome. I've worked on a Roman dig, but it was actually in Northern England on a fort called Winchester. I worked, for there, I worked there for two summers, once as a student and once as a, more a, a supervisor role. But finding those kinds of Roman artifacts outside of Italy is really exciting. It can also lead to debunking assumptions about what the Roman frontier was really like. For example, sites like Vindolanda or Binchester, which were military forts, are often assumed to be uh, a frontier of war, 
the idea is that the military was there, so they must have been fighting the local tribes all the time. And in fact, the archaeology and the history suggests a much different day-to-day -day life for many people. The borders were porous. There were many gates in Hadrian's Wall. It was not the edge of the frontier so much as uh, a blurry line that outlined kind of Roman territory and kind of not Roman territory. There are many records of soldiers from Italy on the frontier marrying local people and raising families wherever they are exactly the same way that military outposts work in the modern world. Let's see. Um, Tudorberg, uh, a few other museums that, that you really liked. Uh, Question from Barbara, what digital electronic imaging or testing methods have you personally worked with? I have worked with both GPR and LIDAR, although I was using land-based rather than aerial LIDAR. Uh, I worked with GPR on my own excavation and LIDAR as a volunteer on, on somebody else's. I have also done some work with magnetometry which measures changes in soil magnetism, which again signals uh, differences in soil type, and that can be clues about where to dig. I think that that's the extent of the electronic and digital survey systems that I've worked with personally. Um, let's see. So, uh, going back, I think, to Chattahoyuk, uh, predating agriculture, because Chattahoyuk was lived in and occupied over such a long period of time, I don't know how the very first settlement at Chattahoyuk matches up with evidence of local agriculture. However, one of the steps in having a settlement of the scale that you have at a place like Chattahoyuk is a reliance on sustainable food of some kind. There are, of course, multiple ways to get there, but agriculture certainly existed during the time that Chattahoyuk was occupied. Let's see, how does decision-making work among the many people working together on a project? Does the source of funding have the most influence? Are the participants usually in agreement on the goals? Excellent questions. So uh, decision-making is ideally done collaboratively, although like many scientific ventures, there tend to be principal investigators. Often these are academic archaeologists or the leads of professional firms like a cultural resource management firm. However, in my own work, for example, uh, collaboration is something that starts before any kind of excavation or analysis has taken place at all. So by talking to other stakeholders, in my case, the local Chinese American community in Palo Alto and Santa Clara counties, uh, Palo Alto and the wider Santa Clara County, the kinds of research questions that I ended up asking about connections between people living at the site and uh, family or other places around the Bay Area were very influenced by the conversations that I had and the interests expressed by the local and descendant community. Participants are ideally in agreement with the goals of an excavation, but of course, communities are not monolithic. You can't say that 100% of people from any given community are always going to be on the same page. And so this is one way in which archaeology tends to be political. 
you can't separate out political decision making from the process of doing archaeological research. So being aware of which community members you're cooperating with, what other experts, what your funding sources are, is really important. Does the for source of funding have the most influence? In academia, there tends to be a uh, there tends to be an emphasis on the researchers and hopefully hopefully collaborators having uh, the academic freedom to conduct research according to the research questions that they come up with. But of course, they do need to find funding to answer those research questions. So funding might tend to go to certain kinds of digs, often digs that focus on ancient sites more frequently than digs that focus on relatively recent history. At least that's the way it's been uh, recently. So in that sense, funding can dictate how well a project is equipped, but it doesn't tend to dictate something like what the research questions actually are. Um, Reddit, uh, oh yes, about the, uh, the Romans in forests. Do you have a favorite archeology span site? One that you proselytize about? Well, uh, my favorite archeology span museums are the Penn Museum and the Museum of Anthropology at the University of British Columbia, which is quite a mouthful, so everyone calls it MOA. But in terms of sites, I'm not sure that there's one that I would say everyone needs to visit, but I do think that it's important to be aware of sites wherever you are. Being aware of local history and archeology span can give you a very different sense of a place, even if you've lived there your whole life. So I encourage people to read about local archeology, span archeology span of Chinatown in San Jose, archaeology at the Presidio in San Francisco, or information about the shell mounds around the Bay Area? Great question. Where else have I worked? So my own excavation was in Palo Alto, and then I did work in museums too. But I have worked on other people's digs in many places. As a high schooler, I helped out on digs at the Presidio in San Francisco. And in college, I worked on digs in Turkey at Chattahoyuk, in England at Binchester, and at Hungate, which is one of the, the Viking digs in York. Some of you may have visited Jorvik, uh, the Viking Museum in York, England. I've also worked in Hawaii and in the Caribbean. In Hawaii, I helped out on an excavation on Maui. And in the Caribbean, I was working in the British Virgin Islands. That involved very limited excavation. It focused on survey. I've visited other archeology span sites around the world. Most recently with my boyfriend in Mexico, I got to visit Teotihuacan and Tenochtitlan and really enjoyed seeing both. A couple other questions um, from Rick. When you visited Crete in the 1960s, there were three major sites at different stages of reconstruction, a great lesson in archaeological processes. That is really exciting to see. Uh, I just mentioned being able to see sites in Mexico. One of my favorite parts was seeing the different layers of the pyramids in Mexico City. And because uh, a pipe had been put through the site, uh, I think in the 19th century, although I could be wrong, uh, there was a walkway that uh, cut right into part of the pyramid. And you can walk through the different layers and see how the place has changed over time. And that was really exciting to see. I haven't gotten a chance to visit Greece, uh, Crete, or even to go to Italy. And it's something that I would love to do in the future. 
What do you think of the expansion of Chichen Itza uncovering more buildings, discovery of other jungle-based sites? Often there are uh, news stories about the discovery of sites in jungles, particularly with the advent of LIDAR technology and being able to look at the multiple returns that give a glimpse of sites under tree cover. I think that it's really exciting, but it's also important to remember that archaeology is a destructive science. Once you dig something up, you can't dig it up again. So sites that were excavated in the 19th century might be the most well known, but 19th century excavation techniques often destroyed many of the things that archeologists look for today. For example, one of the first things that people tended to do was wash pots and vessels and uh, amphora, but that means that modern chemical analysis can't be used to identify the contents that they, they once had through residue. And so I think that it's always exciting when there are new discoveries, but that it's also important to think about the preservation and the ethics involved in extracting anything, anything from the ground, which is one of the reasons that indigenous methods in archeology span and alternative methods to excavation are so exciting. Uh, Broken spear points and pottery sherds were tossed out by uh, local cave entrances. It uh, looks like in Tennessee. Do these discarded items need to be returned to their descendants? So that's a complicated question and something that I often encounter. People will tell me about uh, projectile points, which is the archeological term for arrowheads, since we're not sure whether they're arrows or darts or spears or other tools without further analysis. So you'll often hear archeologists refer to projectile points rather than arrowheads. In general, as I talked about with the, the pottery sherds, one of the most powerful tools for understanding the past is the context from which the artifacts once came. Often those things are in place because of some specific activity that happened in the past and only through finding things in situ are archeologists able to tell more about people's lives. When it comes to artifacts that are associated with specific Native American tribes, communities, or other cultural groups, Often those items have complicated significances that have to do with ongoing practices and spiritual beliefs. And so what I mentioned earlier about being informed about local archeology span as my, my version of proselytizing a particular site, I think it's important to be aware of local native cultures, to learn more about the living descendants, what kinds of activism they're involved in. And you may find that there are particular places or known archeology span sites that are very well known to your local community and that they have published and stated what they hope people from outside their community do when interacting with those places. Thank you so much for asking questions in chat. I, I hope that that was a, an engaging way to follow up on the, on the seven myths. Um, and some questions for me to follow up on as well. I don't know the, the origin of the two spotted, uh, two spouted pots. And I wanna clear up exactly what Chattahoyuk's temporal relationship to agriculture was in the local area. So thank you for bringing both of those up. Uh, I'm happy to stick around and answer other questions. We're happy to talk to you, to any of you out loud, 
but I think that it's been just about exactly an hour since I started talking. Uh, so thank you so much for tuning in and listening to me. And thank you, San Francisco Mensa, for hosting me today. I really appreciate all the setup that you did. Please check your backyards, literally, but also figuratively, and learn about the, the local people wherever you are. Thank you so much. Thank you.